what is personality to you? How do you think about personality? Yeah, so I guess my my view on this is slightly different than um, a, more, a fairly traditional psychologist might have. And psychologists tend to think about personality as just patterns of behavior and thought and emotion that people have. So what characterizes you as a person? What's your personality? And that's sort of an intuitive folk definition, but it it's to me not particularly scientific. Um I think if we if we want to think about what personality is, it's important to think about what personality does for us. Right? Like why do we pay attention to personality? What is the thing that we're paying attention to when we talk about personality? And <clears throat> I think a lot of it comes down to prediction and communication. So we want to be able to figure out what someone is like and therefore what they're likely to do in a new situation. So based on what we know about someone, what are they going to do when a new situation arises or when a situation that we're used to arises, but we haven't been with this person in or um, et cetera. And also if we're trying to tell someone else about somebody, if I'm trying to tell you about someone that you don't know, what do I need to tell you about them to help you make predictions about what they're likely to be like and what they're likely to do? And I think though the answers to those questions are generally what we really mean by personality, right? Personality, therefore, are patterns of behavior and patterns of responses that vary between people in meaningful ways so that we can use those things to make predictions. So it's got to be things that vary so that not everyone's the same. And they've got to be things that help us make predictions in the kinds of scenarios we're likely to find ourselves. Which gets to what I, uh, you know, where we're going when it comes to uh, cultural differences and cultural influences of personality, because the set of contexts in which we have to observe behavior and the set of possible behaviors that are permissible or allowable differ between cultural contexts. And so when we talk about what personality is and ask if it's going to vary between cultures, if you think about it this way, of course, the answer is, of course, it varies between cultures because the, the ways to be a person vary between cultures. So, um, I just want to I just want to back up one second on the the function of personality. You mentioned there are a couple of purposes that it serves in terms of like the wider social s circle that I'm in, right? Why it might be useful for for others to identify a pattern of behavior so that they can predict what I'm going to do. Is there what, what's what's the function though for me to have a personality like what why would something like personality evolve in the first place ah sure yeah that's a really important part of the the uh the equation that i didn't answer in the last thing um so yeah um imagine everyone was the same there are going to be certain niches certain ways to be that are not um are not filled by uh, one particular behavioral paradigm, one pre pre uh, particular behavioral strategy, right? So if everyone is really outgoing and just gung-ho and really like quick to act, then it may be actually beneficial for you to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be a little more chill and I'm going to wait and reflect on things and not do those things that you're all doing. And I will benefit by being the person who takes time and doesn't go rushing into new places because I can take advantage of what's left behind. Right? Or I can take advantage of being the person who's less likely to get into fights. Or uh, you can think of there, or the person who's less likely to go and try something new at the first time I see something novel because the people who do try something new get eaten half the time. Um, but if no one tries something new and you're in a group where very few people are exploring or are very outgoing, then it can be beneficial to be the, the explorer. And you benefit by being someone different. And the group can potentially benefit 
Um, but I, it's important to also remember that these benefits exist at the individual level as well. And evolutionary people who think about the evolution of personality often think about these kinds of frequency dependent effects, like the fitness, the evolutionary fitness of a strategy is dependent not only on what you do, but how common your strategy is, your way of being, your trait is relative to the other traits. And so people have argued, um, Dan Nettle has this really great book on the evolution of personality where he sort of lays all this out uh, particularly clearly. Um, that for any particular personality trait, if, if everyone is very introverted, then it may help to be extroverted. If everyone is very um, agreeable, it may help to be kind of contrary and vice versa. And so uh, you may get these frequency dependent balancing selection effects where a mixture of traits is actually the optimal situation. Now, there are certain cases, that's not true for everything, right? Like there are certain behaviors that are so important to do right that it would be very bad to not do that, right? So like nobody has the personality trait of screaming constantly all the time, <laughs> right? That, you know, there, there are constraints on the reasonable variation. Right. So uh, if I understand you correctly, person what we call personality of course as we've already discussed it's it's almost like the 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 probability that i'm going to do certain behaviors and not other behaviors um i'm going to preferentially act in certain ways most of the time or or in, you know at, at at different rates than i will other behaviors that's i might just get certain benefits from doing that based on what everybody else is doing. But what it, what, once you have that distribution of personalities, um, the, what can piggyback off the back of that is the second order benefit within other people in the society. Once we're sort of, if we assume that we're already living in a social context, they're able to identify and predict my behavior. And that, that, that allows for all of these interesting sort of second order social effects and social dynamics. Sure. I, I, so yes, um, but there's an, a yes and. I mean, there's the difference between sort of the trait in and of itself and the meaning of the trait in relation to other people. And what we call personality is meaningless or, or requires the second part of that to really be fully understood. So we have behaviors that are generated by a combination of our physical bodies and the way our brain is organized and the particular state we're in at various times and the stimuli we get and our, our life experiences and developmental trajectories that shape the kinds of associations we make. And there's a lot of variation between people just based on those things, right? And for any individual and not just humans, but any animal with a, a nervous system that of, you know, sort of a modicum of sophistication, there's going to be some variation in the way individuals respond to different kinds of scenarios. And we can say, okay, uh, there are sort of reliable variation in certain kinds of behaviors that tend to cluster together. And those clusters of behaviors are kind of what we mean by personality, because we say, well, uh, when someone is extroverted, that generally means that they like to talk a lot and seek social uh, situations and, and they like to be at the center of attention. And you can see how that carries over from different contexts, whether it's a work meeting or a family gathering or being in the street. Of course, personality can also be context dependent, right? There are some people who are really extroverted in some situations and introverted in other situations. So it gets more complicated there as well. Um, but why do we use the, the kinds of clusters that we, that we do? Why do we talk about extroversion? Well, it's because social situations are important to us as humans, right? Especially in the particular cultures that we're in. So if you lived in isolation in groups, of, if, if people tended to be pretty solitary, all the time, there would be no reason to have a variation to uh, terms like extroverted and introverted because 
there would be no variation. There's no context in which that variation makes sense. So there has to be something, some situation that allows for variation in a particular dimension. And then, yeah, uh, well, let's, I'll stop there and we can continue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, well, let's, let's dig into the, um, the, the big five personality traits then and, and, and your thesis as to why, what, what that picture misses because it's often put as this is sort of like a universal uh, structure for the the types of personalities that people have um but of course it is a a um a structure that we've found by studying certain types of societies our own types of societies so what where does it fall short and why right so i mean I'll start out by giving some credit to the big five. So uh, psychology is very difficult. Behavior is difficult. Cognition is difficult because we're trying to translate things that are inherently phenomenal phenomenological. Like there are things that we experience in the world and trying to measure them scientifically. Right? And if you go from something like physics where you're measuring how much something is you know, resistant to force you, you can you can or charge or whatever you can actually measure these things extremely precisely and define your terms in terms of the measurement right and define your theories in terms of the measurement mass etc velocity um, even in certain kinds of biology you, you know you can define a cell or a DNA or you know an allele or a polymorphism pretty precisely but defining personality, defining memory, defining emotion, these things are, are difficult, right? So the main challenge of the behavioral sciences is to find good measurements. And we know that people differ. We just observe it all the time. It's very obvious that people are different and that we use words to describe people. Um, so at some point, people started thinking about using clusterings, clusters of the way we describe people in order to, and measuring those things. Now, you know, if you look at the animal literature, people use very simple measures of behavior, like novelty seeking. Um, and they'll just put an organism in a new place and look at how long it takes for it to start exploring the new place. And there you go. That's your measure. Very, very clear. But you can't do that with humans, right? We can't just like drop humans in like a strange place and say, okay, let's time them to see how long they start exploring. Uh, for one reason, that would be pretty unethical, but also it just wouldn't capture the things that we care about. Um, so a number of researchers, you know, decades ago started thinking about the ways in which people varied and they started making big surveys, hundreds of questions and asking people both about themselves and others, how they fit in, in terms of different kinds of scenarios. Like, well, would you, are you the kind of person that tends to do this? Are you the kind of person that tends to do that? You know, are you the kind of person that likes attention? Are you the kind of person that's very shy? Are you the kind of person that, you know, uh, worries a lot? Are you the person that tends to make decisions without worrying, et cetera? You give people hundreds of these questions. The With the big five, the full battery is something like 240 questions. And then you do a, a magical statistical test <laughs> called exploratory factor analysis, which is uh, a particular manipulation of the data. But really what it is, is looking to see, imagine you have a bunch of items and an item is just a, a question in which there's a response that varies in one dimension from like zero to 10 or whatever it is. And then you look for items that tend to correlate. So if the answer is on question three and the answer is on question 10, seem to correlate like people who answer you know score high on question three also tend to score high on question 10 or tend to score low on question 10 that's also a correlation right they score high on question three and they score low on question 10 one tends to predict the other what you do is you look for clusters of questions that tend to correlate pretty highly with each other and not so much with others so you're looking for basically clusters and this is 
it wasn't thought of at the time because it didn't really exist, but now we have network theory. And if you're familiar with network science and community detection algorithms, this is exactly what it is. It's, an, it's a community detection algorithm for a network of items where each node in the network is an item and the edge weight between them is their correlation. So you're looking for clusters of items that are strongly connected to each other and not with others. Right? So communities of items. And what you then can do is figure out, all right, well, how many clusters do we need to explain most of the variation in our data? Can we reduce the dimensionality of these things to say, well, okay, if, if, if I didn't know the, the response to all 240 items, but you just told me how people tended to score on these different clusters, how much does that get us? Like, do, can, I, can I predict what your score probably will be like with a fair amount of accuracy? How much can we reduce that information from 240 items to some number of items? And the most successful attempt of these is the big five, which shocker, reduces 240 items into five items, right? And these are these items tend to cluster and the, the big five sometimes is a, there's an acronym, there's a couple acronyms, you can spell ocean or you can spell canoe, whatever your preference is. Um, so ocean is openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And these are dimensions. Each of them have sub items. So you can, if you look at the sub item sub factors, you can get a bit more information out of them. Um, but those are the main, the main things. There are some competing ones. There's one called Hexaco, uh, which is a six factor model. I can't remember what the sixth factor with Hexaco is. Um, and these are pretty, pretty neat. And they, to give them credit, they work very well in Western industrialized societies in predicting typical behaviors in sort of mainstream activities like office places um, and, you know, relationship like marital relationships, things that are fairly normative and the, uh, in that, you know, there's fairly common norms of what the, the reasonable constraints are and everyone sort of knows what the scenarios are. Um, there, the problem is that there's a common assumption, which is that these factors are something universal about human psychology, that when you, you know, there's something about these factors that is a true thing about human beings rather than an artifact of the particular cultural scenario that we're in. And I, that's what I'm sort of pushing back on. My colleagues and I are pushing back on. Okay. Okay. So... Is there evidence, and what is that evidence that this might not hold? This, 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 um, you know, that the, the big five personality model might not hold across all human societies. Right. Um, there is. There's a good evidence. I mean, first of all, you see some evidence when you try to translate uh, the big five battery of tests to the languages of other cultures. Right. If you if you ask somebody, you know, um, is, is something is somebody particularly, um, um, oh, what's the word? I was just having a conversation with a colleague of mine about this, and I'm trying to remember. Um, okay. Um, so if if you ask somebody like, is somebody kind of shiftless? Are they kind of lazy? That's something that makes sense to us. But in you know, if you go to let's say Kenya and you ask people among the Turkana in Kenya, this is something that the, the anthropologist Matt Zefferman told me. Um, they don't really know what that means. That's just not a personality trait that occurs in their society. Um, there's no variation in that, and in fact, this occurs a lot when anthropologists have gone to non-Western, non-industrialized societies and tried to give them these these tests you just don't see the kind of variation in most of the, the, um, the factors that you'd expect that there's just no variation among some of them. There, there's no basically affordances to vary on some of these. So for example, um, you know, if you go to rural Senegal, right, there's basically no variation in openness or conscientiousness. 
uh, everyone's conscientious. So it doesn't make sense to say that someone is low in conscientiousness, doesn't, you know, think about or worry about what other people think, right? That sort of conscientiousness. Because everybody there, it's so normatively entrenched to, to be conscientious, it's completely unpredictive to talk about somebody's conscientiousness. Um, if you go to uh, the Ache in Paraguay, right? Um, they have something similar where everybody is agreeable, right? And, you know, you, you talk to other anthropologists and, you know, you, you hear about things like there are certain behaviors that are not just not normative, like nobody shows overt anger or nobody breaks down and cries and sort of shows negative emotion. And it's just not like people don't feel these things. It's that because we're all human inside. It's not like people don't get sad in these these cultures. It's that the expression of sadness overtly, like, you know, just going into a depression well and sitting against a tree and crying for hours is basically just not allowed. And so nobody does it. Nobody thinks to do it. Nobody's really upset about it either because it's just not something that occurs to them to do. And so therefore, asking about variation in responsiveness or in emotionality makes no sense because the variation is much, much smaller. Um, one of the, my favorite studies was done by my colleague, Mike Gervin, who's at UC Santa Barbara, who uh, took the, the whole battery of tests um, the, the, of the big five and went um, to Bolivia and studied the Chimane, which is a small scale society of mostly um, pastoral agriculturalists and did not just confirmatory factor analysis where he tr they tried to measure the strength of the big five, which is what the other groups did, but he actually did exploratory factor analysis to try to recover the big five. Okay, we've, can we, we rebuild, we'll look, build clusters starting from scratch and see if we get these big five. And they don't. Among the Chimane, they basically found that you can explain just as much variation as you could in Western societies with the big five with just two factors which didn't map on to any of the big five, right? They called them pro-sociality and industriousness. So basically what you need to know about someone is basically uh, how hard a worker they are and how nice they are. And those are the main things that they care about, at least in terms of the questions that we ask on the big five. Now, there may be other things that vary in those societies that are completely not captured by our batteries, which is its own kind of problem, right? Um, so if... If if you know if you don't know the answer to this, that's that's fine. But what 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 would explain why those pastoral agriculturalists in Bolivia that your colleague studied would only would you know the the the, the main dimensions would just be these two factors of industrialist and pro sociality? Like why? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question, and I have I have an answer to sort of one version of that, and not an answer to another. Right? If the question is why those specifically, why pro sociality and the industriousness specifically, the best I can do is say, well, those are things that those groups care about, and those are the things that matter to them in terms of the way people vary. Um, they do a lot of cooperative work they they work together so they they really need to know if, if someone is going to be a team player or not and there there are probably enough options for people who are sort of more loners to do that but um sort of industriousness is the thing that really people really care about and generosity um so there's enough variation for people to care about uh for for people to vary um and those are the things that are predictive but I don't. I've never been to Bolivia, and so I'm not an, enough of an expert on the Chimane to to say for sure. Uh, you'd have to ask one of my colleagues who does. Um, the other, there's another version of this question though, which is why in general do some societies seem to have more factors of person and more ways to be than others? And this is uh, an idea that uh, my colleagues and I uh, have. Um, proposed an, uh, an answer to what we call the niche diversity hypothesis. Um, so in 2019, I published a paper in the journal Nature, Nature Human Behavior with my co-authors Mike Gervin, Aaron Lukashevsky, and Chris von Rudin. Um, Chris and Mike are anthropologists, and Aaron is a psychologist. And what we tried to do was explain why, as you get into more sort of complex societies, you seem to have 
more traits. And this, there's data to suggest that this is really a phenomenon, right? So there's all the examples from small scale societies where you basically don't recover the big five or you don't see a lot of variation in the big five. Um, what Aaron and, and his uh, colleagues did in a separate study was get data from 55 industrialized or partially industrialized countries and compare correlations between factors. So these factors are supposed to be separate, right? Like conscientiousness is supposed to not correlate with openness, but it, they do a little bit. And you can look at the extent to which they correlate. And what you find is if you, if you get a measure, you can get a measure of sort of social complexity. Um, and this was a, a, basically you take data from the UN's Human Development Index and measures of how many people live in cities and how many, uh, sort of something called sectoral diversity, which is basically how many different jobs there are. And you can get a measure uh, at the country level of sort of social, social or social ecological uh, complexity. And in the more complex societies, you get less correlation between personality traits in the big five. So the traits seem to be more independent. In less complex societies, there's more dependence between traits, which fits with the fewer apparent traits at all. There's less variation uh, in the small scale societies. There's a caveat here, and I, I just want to make sure that I say it, which is that when I talk about, and I'll keep talking about cultural complexity in complex or simpler, more complex or more simple societies, that I am talking about the societies in terms of their organization and not at all about the people in the societies. It, it is not, not about how complex individuals are. People are complex all over. And, uh, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I, I've, I've had this, uh, had made the same distinction myself when, when thinking about this and like an essay that I wrote, like to, 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 to stress that point. Um, so can you, what you just discussed about, um, the degree to which these um, dimensions of personality co-vary and how that's how that's different depending on societal complexity and can you explain that in layman's terms what is what what does that actually sort of equate to if you're going to explain that to the average person on the street all right i'll do my best so in very coarse grain terms imagine that in a less complex society, someone who is very extroverted may tend not to be particularly conscientious. Those two things co-vary, they correlate negatively in this case, in this example that I've just made up. Doesn't mean that it's always the case that people who are very extroverted are not conscientious, but there is a general tendency in the population for these things to co-vary in this way. In a very complex society where there's lots of potential ways to be, there's no correlation. You can't tell anything about someone's likely conscientiousness if all you know about them is their agreeableness. Whereas in the simpler society, you can make a, a prediction with at least some degree of accuracy. This effect is not huge, so there's, there's still a lot of error, but there is a stronger correlation between traits in the simpler society than in the more complex society. Right. So is that, is it an oversimplification to say that there are more personalities or potential personalities in complex societies than in less complex societies? It's, it's an oversimplification, but I don't think it's wrong. Uh, just just oversimplified. I think that's I think that's kind of right. Um, so, yeah, my colleagues and I have proposed this, and and what we did was to create a, a computer model in which you have a, a population of, of individuals or, or agents or whatever you like that have a bunch of traits, and we can think of these as behavioral traits or personality traits if you like. Um, but let's just call them behavioral traits for now. And they, they vary a lot. There's initially no correlation at all between the different traits. Now, individuals are born in a society that have some number of socioeconomic and ecological niches. 
jobs they can do, professions they can go in, tasks they can, you know, take on roles within the society that they can take on. Um, now, in certain societies, simpler societies, the main thing that we focus on is just the diversity of these niches. In a small scale society, the number of ways to be, the number of potential roles for you to have within a society is relatively constrained. It's smaller. There's only a certain number of ways that you can be a successful human being. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take on a particular role. Hopefully it kind of fits with your initial temperament, the way you were. But then also through a process of learning and development, you're going to be influenced by the needs that you know, are, are, are made of you, the demands that are made of you within that niche. Now, the same is true in a large scale or more complex society, but in these societies, there are just more niches. You know, in, in our very complex, very large scale societies, right? You can be, well, you can be a YouTuber professionally, right? You can be uh, an, a person who organizes furry conventions, or you can be the person who, you know, cleans up the gunk in the sewer systems, or you can be a chef, or you can be a marathon runner, or, you know, you can just have some grumbly day job, but make like, I don't know, psychedelic trance music in your bedroom and in your spare time. There's so many ways to be. And therefore, um, you have way more options. And so whatever your initial temperament is, you're likely to be able to find something that fits that reasonably well. And therefore, your initial temperaments can be influenced less in the large scale society, in the more complex society, than they would be in the small scale society, which preserves more variation in individual traits and also means that when you look for clusters between traits, correlations between traits, you get less of them. You, get, you don't get none of them, right? Because there are some constraints. Like, again, you can't just be a person that runs down the street screaming at the top of their lungs all the time. That is not an effective strategy. You have to be a person. Um, with there, there are still some norms, even in what uh, looser societies, which in the, in the words of uh, Michelle Gelfand has this distinction between tight and loose societies, which roughly correlates with what we've talked about in terms of complex or simple societies. Um, we've actually rerun our analyses with the tightness and looseness scales rather than our social complexity in index, and you basically get the same results. Um, <clears throat> so we built, a, we built this computational model in which individuals can assort into fewer niches or many niches, and then looked at how, with the niches influence their initial temperaments, how do these traits tend to correlate with each other? We actually did. We said, imagine we, we sort of imagined that we were psychologists that had stumbled upon this artificial society and didn't know how the model worked and just could see the traits. And we did exploratory factor analysis on the traits that we observed in our model as if we didn't know what uh, the process was that generated them. And lo and behold, we got the same effect, which is that the more niches there are, the fewer traits uh, came out of the exploratory factor analysis and the lower the intertrait correlation, the correlation between traits was in uh, the more niches there were, just like we see in the real world data. Right. Um, I want to link this to, uh, I guess, a much broader question, which is like, why why niches provide uh success for the for the people in them you're talking about you know social economic niches that it might exist in small scale versus you know larger scale or loose societies i like this distinction between loose and tight um so let's keep using that but the in the looser societies like why is it a successful niche? Like, what does that even mean for it to be a successful niche for me to be making psychedelic trance in my, in my basement? Like what, what's successful about that? Right. I mean, this is kind of the, you know, the $64,000 question because cultures evolve. Um, 
and which is something that we have not explored yet in our initial analyses, but it's something that we're working on now is sort of to build cultural evolution directly into these models and, and into our theories. Um, so this is a real, a really interesting question, which is how, how does the landscape of successful niches change over time from generation within generations and between generations? How does it come to be that making psychedelic trance in your bedroom can be a successful strategy? Um, I think that, I mean, there's not really a cohesive theory of this that exists yet, but I think, you know, people, the field of cultural evolution as a serious discipline is still relatively young and people are interested in these kinds of questions. But it is, it's, I mean, I think it's an important question because then once you start going down that rabbit hole, the conclusion becomes, well, the distribution of personality traits within a society must change over time. So defining a, a, a culture by its personality traits as measured by these instruments can't be the same from generation to generation if the, if the culture is itself evolving rapidly. Now, some cultures don't evolve rapidly or haven't in the past evolved rapidly. I think these days, pretty much every culture is evolving rapidly. Um, so yeah, there, I think there's, there's so much, so many remaining questions out there about what personality is and how it changes and how it responds to society, to society. But you can't ask those questions until you start taking this holistic view where you think about what the, the purpose of personality is, how personality relates to the cultural structures and the cultural environment, and then how those environments change. Is, is there some important relationship between the, the, the personality that I form and the personalities that other people form in the sense that like similar personalities tend to group together and there's, we, there's some benefits that we all can collectively glean from the fact that like, yeah, we all like psychedelic trance and we're going to meet up and like play psychedelic trance. And like, there's something very um, important in our success as human beings and doing, doing something like that. Absolutely. I think there's a couple of things there. One is that like doesn't only attract like, right? We talked about how, you know, division of labor is often very important and it's good to have complementary interests and complementary traits. Um, so like in romantic relationships, it seems like you don't necessarily want two people in a couple who are exactly the same. You want them to complement each other. Um, but on the other hand, you still need some amount of similarity. And personality and social roles and social identities are all intertwined and entangled. And especially in a complex society like our own, I think it's really important to think about how we figure out where what our place is in our society and who we're going to form coalitions with and relationships with and friendships with and who are we going to assort with and who are we going to see as similar to ourselves and as different from ourselves and so personalities can create communities which then can create social roles and social identities, which then provide opportunities for interacting with new people and to signaling to other people that I am like you, because if I have a sticker on my backpack that shows that I'm a fan of some psychedelic trance DJ and someone I've never met before sees that sticker on my backpack and then also is a fan of that particular DJ, they might use that as an opportunity to start talking to me. And then because we are fans of this DJ, we are likely to have all of, all sorts of other things in common. And so we can use that information. And that's that kind of thing is completely useless if you live in a small scale society where you basically know everybody who you're going to interact with. Or there, there are sort of common, very you know rigid institutional structures for how to interact with people. But in a multicultural, large society like our own, we have to figure out who to talk to and who to avoid. 
And we use all sorts of weird cues and information and signals. And so thinking about who we are as a person, I mean, these are the things that sort of psychologists tend to think about these things too. But I think that taking a, a cultural evolutionary lens puts it in, in a much larger context and I think helps us ask new questions about it. One thing that I still struggle to understand is this is something we sort of talked about last time. So I apologize if we're, if we're covering similar ground, but let's take our own society as an example where there's so many a staggeringly diverse range of niches that people can inhabit. Uh, like wh where is the selection pressure operating if, if, if anywhere, because like to keep using this tired um, example of the, of the psychedelic trance music maker, like psychedelic trance music maker meets another psychedelic trance music maker, but not the same kind of psychedelic trance music maker. They're sufficiently different. Um, and they fall in love and they have babies. Like everybody there's, there's no, there's, biologically speaking in terms of our, our um, genetic reproduction, right? Doesn't seem obvious to me that there is selection pressure happening there, but is there selection pressure happening on another level or is it all just sort of like a free flowing? There's not really a, an overall evolutionary traje trajectory to any of it. Well, I think there is, there is evolution and there is selection, but it's complicated. Um, I mean, genetic evolution in other species is complicated. It's, we think about it as, as if it was simple, but it's not. It's complicated. And then when you add the coevolution of genes and culture in, in, in human societies, it gets really, really complicated. Um, so selection can happen both at the genetic level, but I think more interestingly and, and much more rapidly at the cultural level, but these things are intertwined. So you can think about this. You know, there may not be selection for the trance traits themselves. The traits, like psychedelic trance or whatever, can be completely arbitrary. But the psychological and the cultural systems that enable them can be extremely adaptive because by virtue of having interests and being able to express them and being able to recognize the likelihood of shared interests in others, and therefore be able to assort with them, that makes us much more likely to find partners who are going to interact and cooperate effectively with us. They are likely to share our norms, our values, our references, and therefore that relationship is going to be much more effective. It's going to work better. We're going to do better at raising our kids. We're going to do better at spreading our ideas, and we're going to be better at being integrated in a community and helping that community, and all these things interact I can understand how, you know, our psychology has been shaped by evolution to, to provide this kind of um, dynamic between assorting and with people who are similar to our, to us in personality. Um, I may be answering my own question. Like, is that, is that the only reason that this, <sighs> I guess it's more of a predictive question. What is being selected for when we are, when there is a mass, massive landscape of ideas competing with one another, what, what, what is being selected for? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think that there are a couple of answers. I think at this point, right? I mean, humans, are these hyper-social creatures. We are so attuned to other people. We are so prepared for learning from others, for learning norms, for learning behaviors from others. I mean, the fact that we learn language is astonishing, considering how complex language is. If you tried to write down the rules of language, as people have done, it's very, very hard. And yet, two-year-olds acquire language. Um, we are keyed into learning from each other. We are keyed into learning what is right and what is wrong, what is expected and what is not expected. We are keyed into being pro-social toward certain people and not others and figuring out who to be pro-social toward and not others. 
But those who we are pro-social toward, we are very prepared to share with them and to help them and to learn from them and to expect help from them. And our psychology is extremely versatile because it is more than anything adapted for learning and for sociality. And therefore, we are extremely plastic, meaning that we are extremely malleable, changeable. And therefore, the ways in which we adapt to things can be can vary a lot. Right? We are very good at seeing patterns and forming patterns in, in our minds, categories, concepts, making analogies between things. But the set of analogies that we have, the set of categories that we have can vary quite a bit, right? Because we learn them, we are not born with them. And because we are set up to learn categories and to learn from each other, we can have a lot of diversity, which means that what is selected for in a, to a large extent and the way evolution can really act on humans is not so much in shaping the underlying mechanisms of our psychology or our physiology, but rather on how those psychologies are shaped in development to become adapted or maladapted, as the case may be, to the cultural and environmental milieu in which we are born into and develop into. And so culture creates this amazing variation because we are just naturally malleable plastic individuals. So we can come up with all kinds of stuff. And most of those things fizzle out and die because they're not cultural innovations that provide scaffolds for sort of further innovation or for coalescing people around or for new institutional structures or normative structures to form. But that's okay because this selection is happening at multiple levels constantly and we are organized into larger groups and with pretty strong institutional and normative structures on some certain levels and less strong institutional and normative structures in other levels. We have groups at the level of nations and, and, and races and, and all of humanity, if you like, sometimes. Um, and we also have groups that exist at the level of families and friend groups and companies. And some of these groups are ephemeral. Like we have soccer teams and church groups and things that come together and they go apart. And selection can happen within all these groups, but also selection can act on the structures themselves and on the processes and institutional structures that facilitate the emergence of those structures in the first place and those groups in the first place. I think the um, the program of really trying to understand all this stuff is just coming online in the last decade or two at, at, the, at the most and is extremely exciting to be part of, but I think that there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, okay, we've got only three minutes, so I, I, there's one other thing that I want to... Well, there's a couple okay. of things, but the more, right. more important one... We can go a few is, minutes over, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, one is... And this is not something that you'd like direct... I, can, I don't know if you've directly done research on, but um, in, in, in your, your education, I'm sure that you've um, come across the debate is... I, it's, 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 I don't want to talk about nature versus nurture, but I do want to understand what everything that we've talked about in terms of culture, almost or our society um, providing these avenues for the, diff, the a sort of a different template of person that we can become, or we, we're reacting to the social world that we come into. How? What is the, how much of the person exists a priori coming into that world? What is their, how much temperament do they have and how much does that influence the type of person that they become? Yeah, this, I mean, everyone wants to know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, I almost feel, I almost want to apologize for asking it, but it is a, yeah. It is a missing, it's still something I haven't kind of got my head around. 
there's an old joke uh, that, that goes around among parents, which I am now of two, and they say when you when you when you have your first child, you believe that nurture is everything, and that parents can shape their children to be anything. And when you have your second child, you believe that nature is everything and that genes determine everything about their kids because they end up being so different. Um, and it's obviously both, right? It's obvious. It's always, it's always, the answer is always both. Um, you know, our, our genes and our body and our, in, you know, the, the, the circumstances that lead us to being born start us off right with a set of constraints and a set of opportunities and if you take the same newborn baby and put them in you know different spots all over the world in different kinds of families there's going to be both a lot of variation in the kind of person that that individual turns out to be but there's going to be certain areas on the map that they don't go to right because these things do actually matter, right? Um, I mean, the example I always like is that, you know, if you are just naturally like a six foot eight or, you know, two and a half meters tall, giant strong man, and that's just your genes, your life is going to be different than if you're, you know, one and a half meters, five foot, you know, even tall and are prone to weakness and, and let's say, you know, being overweight, right? That's just naturally going to sh- change the things the things you're able to do and the experiences you have, the way people react to you, and that has nothing to do with your intelligence or whatever. Things like intelligence, this is its own can of worms and I'm not going to go into it, but um, obviously culture shapes tremendously the kind of people we are because it tells us what to pay attention to in the world. It tells us the kinds of things that there are in the world. I mean, cultures have stories, right? Every culture has a series of myths, and they're the myths that are religious, but they're also the myths of what there is in the world and what things matter and what things don't. And everything that we are and everything that we know is seen through the lens of stories, of of the things that there are in the world or can be in the world, and the things that we don't pay attention to. We, people get very excited when there's a new story that is sort of both familiar enough that they can understand it, but different enough that it lets them see things in new ways. And that's sort of where, that's the sweet spot. And so there's, there's a lot of potential for differentiation and to become a different kind of person by virtue of where you're born. Once you are a person, I think, you know, it's hard to be a different kind of cultural creature if, you, if you're already an adult. Right? All you can do is sort of try to be open-minded and try to understand that the way that you are is not the only way to be. And that there are lots of other ways to be and yours is not necessarily preferred. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of preferred status in the world. Right? You just happen to have been a certain way. Yeah. Um, the uh, podcaster Sam Harris. I don't know if you've um, ever listened I, to any of his stuff. I I, I read a, I read a couple of his books back in the day. Or his books, yeah. Um, he because I he's talked uh, this woman who you mentioned the loose versus tight. What's her name again? Michelle Gelfand. Michelle Gelfand. She he, he had her on his podcast recently, um, and in the context of you know the the discussion, Sam. Um, conceptualized culture as like an operating system to use the analogy of a computer what do you think about that how fit is that as as an analogy yeah i mean you know all analogies break at some point um i i don't it's not obvious to me what the added value of that analogy is so there's this people love making analogies to computers and saying something is like the hardware and the other thing is like the software. It's these analogies are everywhere. Right. Um, but I don't think that that's right because um, because the culture is changing. It's 
and it's changing by virtue of the individuals in it as well. So it's, it's, um, this is also a bad analogy, but, you know, imagine, you know, culture is like a riverbank, uh, along which water is flowing. Now the culture shapes the directions that the water can flow and doesn't flow. It flows along the riverbanks along and, you can, if you draw the riverbanks, you can draw the shape of the river. You know where the river is flowing at all times. But of course, the river flowing changes the shape of the riverbank. And over time, the directions change and you can get offshoots and you can oxbow lakes, which are basically dead ends that are no longer part of the river. And so the, the culture is constantly changing itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I think the part that I might have missed there was that it's, it's more, more like a machine learning algorithm operating system and that it's rewriting its own code but um i get the i get the sentiment um okay i i mean yeah i think there, there's i'm sure analogies. that there's an analogy to be made that i mean sam harris is a smart guy i'm sure he can he can you know he's thought it through at least a bit um just while we're on the topic though and before and before i let you go um something that i've been thinking about which is totally relevant to this last point is like why we use certain analogies and not others like I, I i was on i did a farm stay last year where the farmer was explaining to me how a plant worked using the analogy of solar panels and a battery like the solar panels are the leaves that absorb the energy and it stores it in the roots which are like the battery i thought it's so interesting that the we have to use a machine in order to un a machine analogy to understand the plant. I, I know that you've written some stuff on analogy as like an important building block of language. Um, do, do, do you have any reaction to that? Is, 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 is there something about the way that we decide to use different analogies depending on our cultural context? Or sure. I mean, you know, our cultural knowledge is going to, drastically you know shape the analogies that we make i mean I, and i do i agree with um people like douglas hofstadter who has said you know that analogy is really the core of all cognition and i think to some extent that's right if you think of analogy not as a sort of a grade school a is to b is x is to y kind of formal thing but just anytime you perceive or talk about or conceptualize anything it's always in relationship to something else. Even when you see a chair, you don't just see it for itself. You say it is a chair by virtue of its similarity to the category chair that I have constructed from all the chairs that I have seen and, and their, and their uh, perceived similarities to each other. Nobody tells children, this is how you define a chair. It must have four legs. So you just say that's a chair and that's a chair and that's a chair and that's not a chair. And they say, okay, well, what, what is similar between all these different chairs? That's chair and anything that has sort of a certain amount of similarity to the, you know, sort of prototypical chair, I'll call a chair or has certain, or even when it doesn't look like a chair, if it serves the function of a chair, we can call it a chair in context. Right. Um, and I, I, I mean, so, uh, some colleagues and I, Lottie Brand, Alex Masudi, and I wrote a paper recently um, about the role of analogy in, in the evolution of cumulative culture. I think that not just language, but, but the, the property of language to construct analogy is hugely important in the ability to be the sort of hypercultural, hypersocial species that we are. If I'm trying to communicate something to you, especially uh, something, a complex behavior or how to build a technology or something that's just anything that we need to do together or I need to communicate to you that is complicated, then that's, that's very difficult, right? Like if you're a vervet monkey has a set of five or six, whatever alarm calls that it uses to say, oh, there's an eagle and there's a snake and you make one alarm call to say eagle and then all the other monkeys go down to the lower branches. And you say, snake, everyone goes, runs up into the trees. And they do this very effectively. Um, but that's a very easy stimulus response kind of a thing. There's a, a symbol, and then it has a, a, a single corresponding correct behavior. But if I'm trying to tell you, okay, 
let me tell you how to make a hand axe or a bowl or an, a, a, a bow for a bow and arrow or, I mean, a pencil. Jesus, right? Like things are, it's very hard to try it. Um, honestly, I mean, just try to think about like trying to tell someone how to make a recipe that you like. And if you don't have a recipe already written down, think about all the things you have to communicate to them. It's extremely complicated. And what we need is the ability to say that something is like something else. And that ability gives us tremendous power. So imagine just trying a simple knot, right? Like, like every school kid learns to try a, their shoelaces or a simple bowline knot. You say, okay, the rabbit comes out of the hole, right? It goes back around the tree and then goes back in the hole. This is extremely widespread story. Why? Well, because trying to tell someone the hand movements that they have to make to tie the knot is very, very difficult. We don't have good words for it. And because we don't have good words for it, it's hard to communicate. But there's, we have this, this workaround, right? Where we analogize the head of the tip of the rope or the string to a rabbit and a hole in a tree and the rest of the, the, the rope into a hole in a tree. And so if you can imagine a rabbit going out of a hole and around the tree and back in the hole, then you can always remember how to tie the knot. And so if you have these other things that you know, and you have shared knowledge within a population of people, then all of a sudden, this whole new range of possibilities for communication opens up because now you can, you can build analogies, you can explain new things in terms of old things.